I'm Harry Chrysler uh, of the Institute of International Studies. Uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Institute of International Studies uh, to the uh, 7th Biannual Pather Sather Symposium, which is co-sponsored by the Institute of International Studies and the Institute of Governmental Studies on the campus, uh, but also the uh, Councils of Norway and Sweden. Uh, and I want to thank all of those organizations for helping uh, put this event uh, on today. The Pather Sather Symposium represents an ongoing collaboration between the governments of Norway and Sweden and the University of California at Berkeley. The event is designed to foster interdisciplinary discussion among scholars and policymakers from Europe and the US on global and national issues of mutual concern. The symposium honors Pater Sather and his wife Jane Crum Sather. Their endowments to the university have enriched the university's teaching resources and beautification, notably the Sather Gate, which is the main entrance to the UC campus. In this way, the Sather name has come to symbolize a legacy of collaboration between Norway and the University of California. With the Sather legacy in mind, the University and the Royal Norwegian Council General of San Francisco inaugurated the first Pather Sather Symposium in 1991. The topic, by the way, of that first symposium uh, was the science and policy of climate change. So a lot of work uh, still needs to be done. And our topic for today's symposium continues that tradition, and we are calling it Translating Climate Change Science into Public Policy. And I'm going to introduce our uh, distinguished panel. And what we're going to do is each of our three panelists will come up uh, first to uh, offer some, a brief statement. Uh, and that will be followed by comments by uh, two Berkeley faculty members. Uh, beginning uh, on uh, my left, uh, Lars Eric Lillialund is Director General of the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. The Swedish Environmental Protection Agency is Sweden's central environmental authority. He holds a doctor degree in plant ecology and has since 1981 worked at the Swedish EPA during three separate periods. During four years, he was director of the Environmental Advisory Council at the Ministry of the Environment, and for three years, he worked at the Swedish Society of Nature Conservation as director of nature conservation research. Harold Moe is deputy director of the Fritjof Nansen Institute in Oslo, Norway. That institute is an institute, an independent foundation engaged in research on international environmental issues, energy and resource management politics. A political scientist, his areas of research include Russian energy and environmental policy, Norwegian nuclear policy, and the development of European gas markets. Uh, John Wilson is advisor to Commissioner Arthur H. Rosenfield of the California Energy Commission. He has worked for the California Energy Commission since its beginning in 1977. The commission is California's long-range planning agency and is responsible for demand forecasting, supply assessment, efficiency standards, public interest R&D, power plant licensing, and contingency planning. For the last 22 years, John has worked as an advisor to a series of commissioners. Uh, in his present capacity, he is an advisor to Art Rosenfeld. John has worked in all areas of the commission's responsibility, including power plant licensing, energy demand and supply assessment, and directing the commission's public interest energy research program. 
Our commentators are uh, David Karen, who is the William Max Siner Distinguished Professor of Law. His research interests include international adjudication and arbitration, the law of the sea, and environmental issues, including ecological and social dimension of global change. John Hart is Professor of Energy and Resources and at the Ecosystem Science Division of the College of Natural Resources. His research focuses on the effects of human actions on and the linkages among biodiversity, ecosystem structure and function, ecosystem structure and function, and climate. An overarching goal of his research is to understand the interdependence of human well-being and the health of ecosystems. Two specific goals are to understand the nature and causes of patterns in the distribution and abundance of species and to understand the extent to which ecosystem responses to climate change may result in feedbacks to climate change that can either ameliorate or exacerbate global warming. So we have a distinguished group before us, and we will begin uh, the proceedings with uh, comments uh, by Lars Erik Lillilund, the Director General of the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. And. Uh, also, thank you very much for inviting me to this symposium. Climate change, science, and how to communicate with the public and stakeholders, the policy level, but the public level, is, of course, an extreme challenge. Uh, climate change is a, a totally different type of environmental problem than many others that we have tackled during the last decades. Um, chemicals, emissions of sulfur, uh, and such things can normally be handled in a more technical way by substitution and such things. But climate change and uh, the driving forces behind it, greenhouse, different type of greenhouse gases, is so much related to the structure of the human society and how we have built the society. And it needs, it goes deeper, that I, I have to say, that, that for many other uh, of the uh, environmental problems. Um, as environmental policy in general, it's very much stand on a scientific ground. Uh, very much of the environmental policy is scientific driven. Many of the environmental problems have the origin from the scientific community who said something is going on here. Climate change, in fact, was first mentioned by the Swedish Nobel Prize winner Sante Arrhenius, 1906, I think, and said that uh, uh, it, it will give an impact on the climate with the emissions of greenhouse gases. And then it was continuing working in the scientific community in different countries. Uh, how to translate climate research then to uh, policy to the public, uh, since it is such a complex item? Uh, first, I think it's important that uh, we have to work, as we are doing in Sweden, constantly to bridge the gap between research and policy making. Uh, there is a need, as we also have a mutual dialogue. Uh, between the scientific community and the climate policy decision makers. And it's also important that the uh, strategies to combat climate change are based on research of a high quality. Um, secondly, it can be achieved by the research being directly presented to the general public, business, non-governmental -government, organizations, and so on, which through strong opinion forming can in turn influence policy orientation. Uh, what my agency, I, I, just a few words about Swedish EPA. We are, the, the, as you have already heard, the National Environmental Authority in Sweden. In fact, we are the, the, the first uh, environmental protection agency in the world, established 1967. 
And we are working both on the blue and the green side, which means that we are working both with uh, environment protection, talking about pollutants and such thing, and nature conservation, which I think is a strength when you talk about climate change and effects of climate change. We was asked by the government, uh, I think it was four years from now, to uh, see if we can uh, have a campaign in Sweden which arise the awareness among the public about climate change. And the reasons behind this was that the, the mitigation strategies is very much based, at least in Sweden and I think in many other European countries, on market-based uh, uh, tools like carbon taxes, uh, making uh, uh, tax-free for cars driving on biofuels and more expensive if you have a, a, a huge car with, with high emissions and such things. But also uh, market-based tools when you look at the industry, uh, in, industrial level. So, and if you are going to introduce that type of tools to combat uh, uh, climate change, you need, in fact, as a politician, I suppose, at least, you need, you need an acceptance from the public that that is something going on. So we made, by a Gallup Institute in Sweden, uh, an investigation, and we found that 20% of the public, in general, they know we are 9 million people. 20% uh, of these 9 million people, they are, in general, very well informed about climate change and climate change issues. 20, and, and this group was in fact dominated by women, rather well educated, 40 plus, and 20% of the Swedish public uh, uh, dominated by younger men. Uh, you can spend enormous amount of money to have an awareness raising if you are, uh, have a, a, a campaign focused to them. And, uh, but in the middle, about 60%, you have what we can call potential or sleeping activists. So if you can have a campaign directed to them and, and so they understand something is going on, uh, then you can really, then in fact you have 80% of the, the public uh, home, so to speak. So we were running this campaign uh, in television, advertise and so on, and we have a very good race in the, in the awareness of this problem. And the message was very simple. It was that climate change will have an impact on you. You have an impact on climate change in the way you live, you transport, you eat, consumptions and such things. And now I would like to see if it's possible to show this and how put it on. Yeah. This is this is what we one of the trailers. Yes, yes, this 20 seconds. Uh, what we run in in Swedish television. It's in Swedish, but it ended up the message. There is. <laughs> gas effect. And it, it means that we more and double the knowledge that there is something like greenhouse uh, climate change. We more than uh, doubled that people understand, yes, uh, I have an impact on this. So we could see that immediately in other campaigns run by the road administration about the pressure in tires and such things that individuals started to thinking, how do I how can I change my, my way of living? So now this seems, of course, very, as a very nice story, uh, but you have to continue to keep the awareness in this group on a high level. 
but there is, uh, uh, since we use Gallup investigations before the campaign, during the campaign, and after the campaign, still there is an acceptance that there will be more of different type of instrument introduced to combat climate change. What is, what is then, uh, 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 can work against uh, this? And uh, that is again, the, the behavior of the individual. Because if you look at other environmental problems, the individual say to the authorities, you have to do something with that plant, it emits too much, it smells bad, it, it's noisy. But now, you can't go as an individual to the government and say, you have to do something with me because I emit too much greenhouse gases, <laughs> I have to change my, my, my way of, of living. So, so that is, of course, the most important factor. The other factor, and that is, in all countries, I must say, there is, uh, uh, of course, as in all scientific communities, there is no general consensus. There is, and there always have to be scientists who said, no, this will, the emissions of carbon dioxide will not change the climate. We have that also in Sweden. And that is, of course, something you have to handle because it can be rather confusing for for uh, the, the uh, individual who, for example, belongs to this major group I mentioned. Uh, what about the... Um, uh, uh, and, and that is, of course, a, a role. Media play an important role because news media, they are, of course, very interested to make news. So when we run this campaign, they picked up those few, rather few scientists who are against the theory of climate change and interview them in television and they, even if they are not in fact directly involved in, in climate change research, they get 10 minutes to say that this is ridiculous, we have had an ice cap over Sweden 10,000 years ago and the climate is always changing and it, we sp spend too much on this and so on. So, so that's the news media, but the more scientific oriented media, they are better players, so to speak if you would like to, to, to have a message of this kind. Uh, the, the, the business community in Sweden, they are in general very much committed to climate change. And uh, they in fact they have organized themselves in what they call BLIC, Business Leader for Climate Change, where the big companies is taking the standing in the front line and, and, and announce that what they are doing to, 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 to change what they are doing so they will have a decrease in climate change. Um, I, I also must say that, that um, since we are a member of the European Union, what's happening in the European Union is of course extremely important because we cannot any longer do exactly the same what we would like to do, like the Norwegians can do, because they don't belong to the European Union. <laughs> and uh, 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 which means that, that for example, some of the tools we use, for example, the carbon trading scheme we have, it's, it's a, a, a system we have with the European Union. And frankly speaking, the northern part of Europe is much more aware, working more hard with this than the southern part of Europe. And that, of course, creates problem in the different EU bodies we have. Uh, because we need co consensus and we need uh, mutual agreements in, in our, our uh, uh, work. And now the European Commission have understand that. So in the 5th of June, they have inspired, in fact, by, by inspiration of the campaign we had run two years ago, they are, and UK has also run a campaign about climate change direct to the public. There will be a, a pan-European climate change campaign. Uh, in all the 25 countries. And um, uh, we will see what will be the outcome of this. But it's run by the European Commission. Uh, again, what, what I think it's important when we are going to translate this very scientific issue uh, to the public is to, to try not to complicate the message. If you complicate it, you just can't count in a, a few persons, and that is not enough to get an acceptance for introducing of new tools. You have a need to have a rather simplified message, as you just have seen here, we, we run. And it's also important to add to this some other things. For example, that we need a, a, a one planet policy. In fact, we have a, at the moment, we have a four planet policy. 
if the whole world is living like we are doing in Sweden and you in the United States, we need at least four planets. We need one planet policy and it needs uh, a consensus in the, the global community to, to uh, have a strategy which means that we only have one planet. So things like that have to be added just to pick up and show the complexity of this problem. So by this, I think I stop here and thank you. Thank you. We will pick up some of these themes in the discussion that follows. Our next speaker is Errol Moe uh, from Norway. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I will uh, proceed by uh, saying a few words about the status of the international climate regime. We are here to speak about public policy mainly. But it, I think it's pertinent to say that this is against the background, uh, against the backdrop of an international process which has established an international climate change regime. What can be said about this regime today? Well, how is it possible to discuss or describe or assess an international environmental regime? That is not easy. But three concepts come to mind as useful. And that is the regime's environmental effectiveness, which can be understood as the long-term ability of the regime to solve the problem it was set up to, to combat. Another important uh, um, feature is a regime's cost effectiveness. That is a minimization of social costs to reach a specific target. And thirdly, a regime has to be politically feasible. It has to involve a fair sharing of costs and benefits. How does the international climate regime that was established through the Kyoto Protocol come out on these three parameters? I think it's, it's easier to see the weaknesses than the strength of the regime. It's quite obvious that as of today, the international environmental regime has a very low environmental effectiveness, even if it is perfectly implemented. As you may know, the Kyoto Protocol sets targets for the period 2008 to 2012, and these targets are generally quite lenient. On the other hand, the regime has established an architecture, architecture which allows for quite high cost effectiveness. In the international climate regimes, there are measures designed at equalizing marginal mitigation costs across countries and across sectors. There have been established so-called flexibility mechanisms, international emissions trading, joint implementation of climate projects, clean development mechanisms that are intended to, to put the resources where they are uh, giving most value, to put it that way. Putting mitigation measures where you can obtain most emission cuts for less money. The third indicator, political feasibility, is more controversial. The international climate regime as it stands today involves different groups of participants. There is a group of uh, countries with so-called hard commitments. They are forced to reduce their emissions with sort of significantly. And this group involves a fairly small group of countries in Western Europe, Canada and Japan. Then there is another group of countries with soft commitments. They are formally, they formally have emission targets, but these targets are not really, uh, do, do not really seriously impact on these countries. This includes Russia, Eastern European countries, but also some Western countries like Germany and the United Kingdom, who for specific reasons have not had 
uh, strong for, 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 for specific reasons have had a uh, reduction of emissions that are unrelated to climate policy. Then there is another very large group of countries which has no commitments, namely the developing countries. And then, of course, there are the countries outside the climate regime, notably the United States, the biggest emitter of emissions in the world. So this boils down to a fairly small group of countries really being full members of the climate regime. Does this mean that we are standing, are seeing a uh, totally unsuccessful international endeavor? I think that is too, uh, is to put it too strongly. As was uh, outlined by the previous speaker, the climate issue is extremely complicated. There is still uh, scientific uncertainty, and there is a lot of political complexity. But there is an architecture in place that can be further developed if there is a political will. But notwithstanding the international climate regime, it is pertinent to discuss public policy measures that can both be realized within the framework of the Kyoto regime and also be of value for countries that are outside the international climate regime so far. If you look at the international debate, and notably the debate in, in Europe, it's quite evident that there has been a strong change in emphasis over the last 10 years. From a starting point where environmental effectiveness was focused the most, to the situation today where cost effectiveness is, has come uh, to the forefront. Let me explain. Uh, the European Union was very much against international trading mechanisms in the mid-1990s, arguing that the developed countries would have to take most of the climate, uh, the emission reductions domestically. It was the United States that was the biggest proponent of international flexible mechanisms that would allow for a more cost-efficient climate policy measures. Today, the United States has withdrawn from the international climate regime in the, the negotiations in the, within the Kyoto framework, and the European Union has adopted the initial US policy, being now the, the uh, in ahead in developing emissions trading. Very much the same development has taken place in Norway, but also now the emphasis on cost-efficient climate policy measures are, have much stronger support than they had some years ago. But even if this tendency is clear, I think there is now also a realization that there are limits to what a cost-efficient international climate regime can deliver. There is reason to believe that the, the, the emission cuts that can be realized by way of, for instance, international uh, emissions trading, are limited. So there is a need to find or to, to add other policy measures to, to find more radical solutions. And radical solutions are expected to be found in technological development. In theory, the market mechanisms, which is another word for the international trading mechanism and the other flexibility instruments, will provide incentives for technological change. But the question is, do they do this fast enough? Initially, oh, when, the tri when, when the climate regime now starts working, there will be an incentive for participants to buy allowances where they can get them cheapest. And that is probably going to be possible to do at a low price for a long time. And uh, this will not really mean a change in technology. A company in Norway, for instance, uh, that has to reduce its emissions can, within the Kyoto framework, buy uh, an emissions allowance from Russia. <laughs> 
and this will in reality not have any effect neither on technology development in Norway nor on the international uh, greenness, greenhouse gas problem. So the problem is the, the, the issue is how to introduce mechanisms that can really spur fundamental long-term technological change. It's logical that participants will use the cheapest potential first, but this does not solve the problem. I think one can say that there is a public challenge, both in this country and in the countries within the Kyoto Protocol, how to give incentives to develop and use new technologies. To put it in other words, it's important to find ways uh, where it's possible to internalize the negative social costs of uh, emissions into the spread into the accounting sheets of the actors. Public policy has a role here. And I think that is a general observation, at least in our part of the world, that it, it is necessary to have an, a, a, an active public policy, even if market instruments also have their place. I will then say a few words on studies we have done on the, the effectiveness of various policy instruments. One can distinguish between several forms of public policy means instruments in this regard. Command and control, economic instruments, or information. And in most countries, you will find specific policies that belong in all these three main groups. In Norway and in the Netherlands, we have something in common. We have a fairly big petroleum sector. And uh, this sector has been the target for public policies with the aim of reducing emissions and increasing efficiency. It's been interesting then to look at the different instruments that have been applied and to try to analyze if they have had an had any impact or different impacts in these two countries. In Norway and the Netherlands, similar technologies have been considered to reduce emissions and increase efficiency in the offshore oil business. That is generally to increase, uh, to, to find more efficient product, production methods and processing uh, uh, equipment. It has been a goal to switch um, uh, power source from burning fuel at the platforms to electricity. It has a goal, been a goal to reduce glaring, flaring of natural gas. And it has been a, go a goal to find ways to capture and store CO2, both countries. What can be said after 10 years of policies in this area is that there is a remarkably more uh, innovative technological, technological change in the Norwegian sector than in the Netherlands. Technological, ch technological change in, in the Norwegian offshore oil sector has been fairly radical. With, for instance, the introduction of the world's first combined cycle gas turbine and of uh, <coughs> powering offshore uh, platforms from shore and also the introduction of the first commercial CO2 capture and injection project. Quite big things, all of them. Um, which also can be connected then to the decrease in relative emissions, which has been taking place. In the Dutch petroleum sector, there have been incremental changes, gradual improvement of energy efficiency, modifications of processing and equipment, and diffusion of available technologies. The Dutch have explored radical solutions like CO2 storage, but have not implemented any policies. And they have not had an relative decrease in, in emissions. Question is, what about the policy instruments observed? And this is, of course, a different uh, exercise, as all students of uh, political processes will, uh, will understand. In Norway, the main instrument in the climate policy sphere is the CO2 tax. It's a tax that is imposed on di different kinds of fuels and on specific sectors. And specifically, it has been targeting the oil and gas sector, 
with the aim to promote, promote new abatement technology. It's not the only instrument, but it's clearly the most important. In the Netherlands, they have a different approach. They have so-called voluntary agreements between branch organizations and petroleum companies on the one side and the government on the other. And they set up programs to improve energy efficiency, stabilize emissions, and they have various systems for planning, reporting, and monitoring. And the industry puts together an aggregate industrial environmental plan. This sounds very, very voluntary, very nice, but in reality there is also a threat behind this that if the industry cannot come up with voluntary measures, the government will introduce legislation. So it's a combination of pressure, soft pressure, more knowledge, and creating opportunities for the industry. What we see is that in both countries, the instruments have affected technological change. But what we believe is correct to say is that the tax system in Norway has contributed to shaping the economic conditions under which technologies are developed and adopted. This in turn has stimulated improvements in energy efficiency and affected decisions made to implement more radical technology. The taxation system provides continuous incentives to reduce emissions or invest in abatement technology. In the Netherlands, with a voluntary approach, it has been very efficient in inducing diffusion of available technology, leading to significant increase in energy efficiency. But we, th uh, we see that such voluntary agreements are best suited to facilitate investments and diffusion of best available technology, existing best available technology. But when the cost efficiency potential has been exploited and further measures are not profitable, but in a, sort of a certain period, other incentives, incentive-based instruments are needed. Okay, it's not, this is not to boast about uh, success in Norway, and, and it's, it's, not, it's, it's not really a success versus failure. They're different, uh, different uh, emphasis. There's clearly an, 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 a limit to what the tax system can do to infuse, uh, to spur new technology. Uh, what we have seen in Norway that the important innovations that have been taking place which have been very good in terms of reducing CO2 emissions. They have taken place, or the, the tax system has uh, been introduced at a time where the design of new solutions were needed anyway. At, at a stage where conceptual studies have been carried out for new technologies and different alternatives have been evaluated. So it, at that time, in those stages, we believe that uh, the taxation system can be in efficient in, in pushing the industry into radical new steps. If it had been at a later stage, when the technology is already in place and the question is of retrofit retrofitting existing uh, platforms or equipment, the cost would probably be much higher and the, the, the um, taxation system hardly uh, sufficient. Let me close by saying that this is general policy instrument, voluntary agreements, taxation schemes. But they need to be uh, explored very carefully because there is a risk that one may introduce schemes that will be very costly in terms of uh, transaction cost without much effect. And I think it's, it can be helpful to, to study the experiences of other countries, although, of course, the specific conditions in each country must be taken into place. In Europe, now the trading system introduced by the European Union is likely to become the major instrument, as was uh, reported by Mr. Lidal. And the question is if this system will de deliver enough incentives to, to spur new technology. As it is, the price for CO2 emission quotas is probably a little bit too low to, to, to do that. But this may change if prices increase. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, John Wilson. Thanks, Dr. Chrysler. Well, I'm very honored to be here to speak uh, uh, on this occasion. Um, I think the previous speakers set up very nicely the topics that I would like to talk about today. Uh, 
because I, I guess I, in listening to uh, the two speakers, I, I, I feel like I have a great deal of optimism that we can address climate change. Uh, the, uh, the bad news is it, it's going to take a very long attention span of all of us, and in particular the students in the room, whom I'm very glad to be speaking to today, because this is, this is a problem that's going to be with us for decades. Uh, that's the bad news. But the good news is that if we keep working uh, on large-scale and long-term solutions, we can address uh, this problem successfully. And I think the problem uh, is that uh, the, the public and political attention span is very short, preoccupied with wars and scandals, uh, and climate change is going to require long-term solutions. So what I'd like to talk about today is uh, an overview of a, uh, a way of thinking about climate called stabilization wedges that were developed uh, by two uh, Princeton scientists, Pakala and Sokolov. Uh, and I th then I want to relate that to uh, California's experience. And then I want to uh, give you some 100-year scenarios of global energy use and economic growth, addressing the need for equitable sharing of energy and wealth around the globe. The lesson I hope to draw from this is that we need immediate and persistent efforts related to reducing energy use and that if we're diligent in our efforts, we will have dramatic effects on climate uh, in our future. So the, here are the climate headlines that uh, I think we should all be familiar with. Atmospheric CO2 is, has uh, concentrations in the atmosphere have increased 30% in the last 250 years and two thirds of that in the last 50 years. At current trends, carbon emissions will double in 50 years, leading to a tripling of carbon in the atmosphere. Trying to comprehend the interconnection between emissions, accumulating atmospheric concentrations, and the options to reduce greenhouse gases is a challenge. But this is the kind of consequence that we're now seeing. Uh, this is a uh, recent Science Magazine article um, that, for the first time, I, I think, closely and accurately tracked the rising temperatures in the ocean with uh, the change in patterns of hurricanes around the globe. They took 35-year data using the satellite data for the ocean temperatures, and so that's very reliable. And then they, they looked at the history of uh, serious hurricanes. And what you can see here is that Category 1 hurricanes is, is going down a little bit. That's the blue line. Category 2 and 3 is constant. But here the bad news is that the, in, the number of Category 4 and 5 hurricanes, the really ser serious hurricanes, is going up dramatically from 40 per five-year period to over 80. So we have a serious problem to deal with. And of course, uh, yesterday, uh, Australia was hit with a Category 5 hurricane, the worst hurricane that it has experienced in 30 years. So Bacala and so Sokolow, in trying to uh, give themselves a mental framework for thinking about climate change, came up with the idea of stabilization wedges. What they were trying to address is the problem of uh, the fact that the emissions per year are about 7 billion tons per year. And it's going to double under business as usual trends to about 14 billion tons in 50 years. So they came up with the idea of 15 wedges, or options, which I've streamlined a bit in this slide, that fit into one of these three categories, those that reduce energy use, those that create carbon-free sources of energy, such as nuclear power or renewables, and those that capture and store carbon. Beyond 2054, they assume that there will continue to be reductions in emissions. Now, the wedges don't make the problem any easier to solve, but they do make it easier to look at the options and think about their costs and acceptability, and thereby make it easier for people to explicitly consider the trade-offs needed to save 7 billion tons per year. The good news is, as Bacala and Sokolow said in their paper, that humanity already possesses the fundamental scientific, technical, and industrial know-how to solve the carbon and climate problem for the next half century. But they also said, there is no easy wedge. They are all costly, and as Commissioner Rosenfeld keeps reminding me, there is no physical shortage of energy on Earth. There is just a shortage of money. And I would add a shortage of public and political will to spend it. Amory Levinson of the Rocky Mountain Institute has long talked about no regrets efficiency policies. That is, it doesn't matter if there are doubts about the link between greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. We should save energy because we can save energy. And California has actively pursued efficiency, and we have been very successful, as illustrated in this slide. Up until 1975, both U.S. and California consumption of electricity per capita, which is the y-axis here, was growing at about 2% per year. 
you, get, you can see from about 1960 to 1974, they tracked fairly closely. Uh, but then in, in response to the Arab oil embargo, California decided to have a very proactive energy policy to promote energy efficiency, to develop renewable energy resources, and to create a planning process to consistently assess the supply and demand options available to the states. The results are quite striking. After 1975, California's electricity use per capita has been constant, while the U.S. as a whole has continued to grow at about 1.5 percent per year. The result is that California's electricity use is about 50 percent less today than it otherwise would have been. Since California's electric bill in 2005 was about $32 billion, that means we are saving about $16 billion annually in utility bills we're about $12 billion in net savings, that is, taking into account the fact that we did pay for conservation measures. This is about $1,000 per family per year. And we're not, I'm not even looking at natural gas savings. Uh, as you can imagine, since the electricity crisis in California in 2000 and 2001, we've been kind of electricity-centric, and so most of my uh, data analysis has been, has been focused on that. But uh, to do this in California required public policy and political will sustained over a long period of time. Now to show that politics do matter, and to be a little bit malicious politically, since I'm in Berkeley, this, is, this slide shows the same data for California and the U.S., but this time I've added the red states and the blue states. <laughs> the blue states include states like New York, Washington, and Oregon that have adopted progressive energy policies like California. The red states in general did not. And just to pick another state at random, say, uh, Texas. Uh, <laughs> Texas is, uh, is off the top of the chart. But I wouldn't show that because that would be uh, perhaps unkind. This isn't scientific, but it do, I think it does show that governments can, that take conscious action can shape their energy future. And this is promising. To give you an idea of what this means in specific terms, I want to show some examples of how this was achieved. When the Energy Commission was created, our mandate included direction to adopt efficiency standards for buildings and appliances and to update them on a regular basis. This shows what happened to the efficiency of three major appliances, furnaces, air conditioners, and refrigerators, which are, and the data is normalized to 2002 here at the, the left hand of the uh, x-axis. You can see that furnaces are 25% better, air conditioners are 40% better, and refrigerators are a whopping 75% better than they were. And you can see from the arrows the number of times the California Energy Commission adopted new or updated standards over time. And when, uh, in 1988, they were adopted by Congress and President Reagan as national standards. Putting efficient appliances in efficient buildings increases the savings. This shows that the electricity used in average new homes for air conditioning in California has dropped from about 2,500 kilo kilowatt hours per year in 1970 to less than 1,000 kilowatt hours a year, or one-third less. So while the previous slide showed that air conditioners themselves are 40% better, the fact that they are in more efficient buildings results in nearly 70% reduction in electricity use. And to make it even more striking, since California homes are today almost twice as big as they were in 1970, the electricity used per square foot is about one-sixth today compared to 35 years ago. So this is quite an accomplishment. Another example is refrigerators. The blue line shows uh, average refrigerator electricity consumption going all the way back to uh, 1947. And you can see that uh, it started at about 400 kilowatt hours a year. It increased to over 1,800 kilowatt hours a year by 1974. You can also see that the uh, increase in energy use was correlated with the increase in refrigerator size, which is the, the brown line. But in the late 1970s, the Energy Commission began adopting a series of efficiency standards, which again became federal standards in 1988. And today we are back to the 1950 levels of about 400 kilowatt hours per year, even though volume stayed constant at about 20 cubic feet. I guess I would add that uh, refrigerator size might have kept on going, but fortunately they're limited in size by what you can get through the kitchen door. <laughs> To get an idea of the significance of the savings, we can look at the savings of, in refrigerators alone in terms of electricity that would have been used today if all refrigerators were still at the 1974 level of energy use, shown as the bar on the left, which is about 55,000 megawatts. 55,000 megawatts is equivalent to the output of 55 nuclear plants, 
were roughly the size of all of California's generating, generating capacity. But as you can see, instead, uh, nationwide, uh, the use for refrigerators is 13 gigawatts. Now we can also compare these savings to other power sources. Going across the slide, we can, you see, first of all, you see refrigerator savings. And then you can see the uh, electricity that would be generated by 100 million one kilowatt PV systems. All the conventional hydro generation in the US, all the renewable generation in the US, and all the nuclear generation. But it's also useful to compare the economic value of the savings, which is different because efficiency and PV systems save energy at your meter, which is valued at at least nine cents per kilowatt hour, uh, more in California, while generation sources are worth only about three or four cents at the wholesale level. So looking at this slide, you can see that the savings, the economic savings, the value of the savings for refrigerator standards approach the value of all the nuclear power generated in the US. Looking to the future, there's the promising idea of, quote, zero energy homes, which are now being offered in California and other states. And I say, quote, because zero doesn't really mean zero, but it's a slogan that means, uh, as defined, uh, we've been using in California, is 70% less electricity used, purchased uh, for the home, 25% less total energy, and I say total because I include natural gas, and one kilowatt maximum on peak power demand. The 70% electricity reduction is achieved with extra efficiency measures and the contribution of uh, a two kilowatt PV system. You will see more of these home developments because builders are finding they can build them economically, that is with a small increase in homeowner mortgage, and buyers want them. I think this is a promising sign in terms of our growing, uh, growing our own uh, uh, future energy wedges. And I want to suggest to you that California has its own energy wedges. And it has been uh, the result of persistent action over a long period of time. This slide shows the electricity savings in uh, kilowatt hours going back to 1975. And you can see the largest uh, wedge on the top is the savings from utility-sponsored efficiency programs, which cost ratepayers about 1% of their electric and natural gas bill, and is so small no one notices it. The other two wedges are the state's building and appliance standards, which we've been talking about. Together, they have reduced electricity use in California about 13%. Going forward, there are all kinds of uh, exciting things happening in California. The utility programs are going to grow dramatically to about $6 billion spent over the next 10 years with a goal to reduce energy use by 1% per year or 10% over 10 years, which is nearly as much as has been saved by all programs in California over the last 30 years in the previous slide. The governor has created a green buildings initiative to reduce energy use in commercial buildings by 20% by 2015. The Public Utilities Commission has created a California solar initiative to install 1 million solar roofs by 2017. And the state has a renewable portfolio standard that will add renewable energy to the state's generation mix so that the total percentage from renewables will be 20% by 2010 up from 10% in 2004. For electric utilities, the PUC is creating a cap on greenhouse gas emissions for all utility uh, purchases of electricity. And I said that all new generation must be as clean as natural gas combined cycle power plants. And this essentially bans uh, conventional coal plants. And there are, uh, believe me, uh, proponents of coal plants outside of California that would love to sell coal power to the US. All of these policies are meant to complement the governor's executive order on climate change, which calls for ag aggressive reductions in greenhouse gases. Uh, I think the toughest one, well, the, 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 the biggest one quantitatively is getting to 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. But I actually think, as I look at this, the most challenging goal is the first one, getting to 2,000 levels by uh, 2010. I, that looks like a typo, I apologize. I think uh, getting to near-term goals is actually uh, quite a bit harder. But now I want to look at uh, global energy use. This slide shows carbon per capita on the y-axis and carbon per dollar of gross domestic product for some of the OECD countries, that is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which are basically the 30 most developed countries, and California, which is the red dot. So you can see California compares well to uh, European countries. Uh, we're proud to be better than the United States as a whole. Although we're not as good as, as Sweden, so we still have room to, uh, to move forward <laughs> on. 
But I, I show this slide primarily to emphasize uh, the, the notion of energy intensity, which is measured in terms of dollar per used per, do, I'm sorry, energy used per dollar of gross domestic product, or G over DDP, which is important to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions going forward. So this is a, a statistic we'll, we're gonna, we'll look at in some of the following slides. This slide shows E over GDP trends in the US going back to 1981 in terms of annual changes. Negative numbers are good, meaning that energy, less energy is needed for each dollar of GDP. I broke the years into three intervals. The first is the era of high OPEC oil prices, 1981 to 1986. The second is after the weakening of OPEC, OPEC and the consequent stagnation of U, US efficiency programs like CAFE, 1987 to 1996. And the third begins in 1997 with a growing impact of information technologies on business and the economy. For the US, not surprisingly, E over GDP improved significantly during the OPEC era, lags in the interregnum of the post-OPEC era, and seems to have picked up significantly in the internet era to a robust annual improvement of about 2.7% per year. This slide shows the same data for California, and you can see it follows the same pattern, but with larger savings in E over GDP, uh, that is improvements in E over GDP in uh, all three periods. This shows the European data, which doesn't show the slackening in the, uh, the middle period, um, but shows a, a, uh, a somewhat smaller, I guess in all the periods, than, uh, than the US or California, smaller improvements. And this is showing the world as a whole. Uh, and you can see that the, the average improvement uh, is about 1% per year, which in fact has been about the historic average for the last 100 years, just sort of the natural technology change. Now I wanna construct a scenario for you that takes into account the vast disparities in carbon emissions and wealth in countries around the world. This slide is from the UN's Gapminder website, and I know it's a real eye chart, but I'll describe for you what's, what's in it. It shows carbon emissions per capita on the y-axis, the same as uh, the earlier slide that we were looking at. Uh, but this time, uh, on the x-axis, it's showing GDP per capita for the major countries. And the size of the dot reflects the relative population for each country, and there's a dot here for, well, I guess, every country. You can see uh, the US, uh, as well as other OECD countries, are at the high end, uh, at the top right, the green, and the US being the largest dot. You can see the big dots in the middle are India and China. And uh, Africa and South Asia are the blue dots at the bottom left. Just to sort of generalize about what's up there. So what we want to do is move to the bottom right. We want to have high per capita income and low per capita carbon per person. And, and now I want to do uh, a thought experiment uh, we call the conservation bomb. Today in the world we have about six billion people and world energy use of about 12 terawatts thermal, uh, which means energy use per capita is about two kilowatts globally. And with gross world product of about $25 trillion, the average per capita income is about $4,000. And of course there's a you know, huge range in all of those per capita numbers. In 100 years we could have 100 billion people we would like them all to have access to European, but not US levels of energy services of about five kilowatts per person, as well as European levels of personal income or about $25,000 per person, which implies a gross world product of about $250 trillion. And the historic rate of improvement in energy intensity, as we saw from the, the world slide uh, earlier, is about 1% per year. And if that's what we do for the next 100 years, the world energy use would be about 50 terawatts, or about four worlds more than we have now. And that would be uh, a pretty bad outcome. But if we could increase that rate of improvement to two or 3% per year, which we saw California has done, and even the US as a whole has done, uh, the change in energy use over time is dramatic. It, it, if it's, would be 17 terawatts at 2% or even six terawatts at 3%. Now partly this is just the mathematical magic of taking a small change and multiplying it 100 times, which makes big changes. But in the context of the climate change we are facing, we have to think incrementally and long-term 
And this shows what we can achieve if we do. The question is whether we can create the public attitudes and policies that will result in consistent improvements in energy intensity of two or three percent per year or even more. And we've certainly seen that that is possible. So I like to think about the problem in these terms because two or three percent sounds pretty easy. We've been doing it in California. We've shown we can do it and we have the, and if we have the patience and persistence to really push efficiency, these kinds of dramatic scenarios can result. The California example shows that it can be done. Thank, Thank you. you. You want to turn that off? Yeah. yeah. How can we turn this off? Yeah. I'm going to sure. turn this off. It's always wonderful when you do these panels not knowing how well they will mesh together. And those three did perfectly. And now they'll mesh even more with our commentators. First, David Karen from the law school. When they mesh wonderfully, that means it's a little harder for the commentator. Uh, <laughs> 20, maybe 30 years ago, I read a novel uh, called Timescape that some of you may know. Uh, and it was a novel in which a physics graduate student is studying subatomic particles, and he notices anomalies. And he figures out that someone is sending him a message through the subatomic particles. And he figures out, well, someone must have my lab book to know what my settings are and what exactly I'm doing. And he comes to realize it's himself in the future sending him a message. And he needed to know when the experiment was going to happen, all of that. And the message is that the oceans are dying and you need to do this in order to save the oceans. And what I find, what recently I have felt watching national politics is an irony that the most implausible part of that story is not the time travel. <laughs> it's the fact that the policy people listen to the message that comes back and that you then say, well, I got this message. Right? So it's so refreshing to hear uh, three, although you were more optimistic, John, uh, three optimistic <laughs> messages about what needs to be done. Uh, I've been scribbling down some notes, and I have uh, just four points I want to make in these brief comments. First, about the nature of the problem. I agree entirely with Lars that this is a unique problem. Uh, when, when I teach um, ocean environmental matters, we often start in the middle of the oceans with things like dumping from ships, pollution from ships, and those problems are relatively solvable. When you reach the coastline, when you finally moved away from the center of the oceans, you get harder and harder. When you reach the coast, and it's pollutants coming down the river, and what you're talking about is changing the way people live, then we're reaching tougher problems. Um, I thought John was optimistic when you said for decades, John. Uh, there was a nice quote on the radio today that maybe some of you heard, but the man described um, climate change like the internet. You wake up one morning, it's there, it's growing, and it's never going to go away. <laughs> and you better learn to start dealing with it. Um, so from my understanding of the science, I, I wouldn't have thought with this was, is something that's going to go away. It's an effect. And one question is whether we can control it somewhat. Now, let me just say my second point is very short. And that is, the three presentations have cohered. All of them talk about prevention or delaying climate change or slowing the rate of climate change in speaking to controlling emissions. They do not speak to the consequences of any climate change that is already underway. And that is a whole different area that policymakers need to be listening to science about what are going to be the effects, what are going to be the measures that should be taken. And those are the two things, my last two points, one about prevention and one about adaptation. So as to prevention, um, what I would just emphasize for a moment is something that John Wilson said, and that is um, 
in some ways, climate change has encouraged us to do things we should have done anyways. A number of environmental scientists have pointed this out a long way. Efficiency is a good thing to do. Conservation is a good thing to do. No reason to be wasting this energy. At the same time, and there were a lot of environmental consequences of all that anyways, in terms of waste. Right? So this was all things we should have been doing. So it's not to say we shouldn't do it. It's not all laudable. But in some ways, for the policymaker, climate change has come in and coupled with other arguments that were there anyways and pushed. I thought some of, in your tiers, efficiency, uh, renewables, carbon storage, I think some of those will get harder as you go up the ladder to justify the shifts. And so one thing I want to leave with and I leave this a little bit to John Hart, who knows the science here. And the question, one thing I would like to, to ask, uh, I think that's particularly on John's global chart going out 100 years. We still saw emissions increasing. With hard work, focus on emissions, we could keep them down. Maybe we could even decrease them. Now, does that mean that climate change is going away? Is climate change in the pipeline? is how much would we have to reverse things to somehow bring down. And my understanding of the basic message is this is important to do, crucial to do, to slow down the rate of climate change. This is a phenomenon. It's with us. And it's essential to do. But I think um, I, I, it is not my image that we're somehow grinding it to a halt and going down to zero. But I leave that to John to correct me on. On the um, point of adaptation, adaptation presents a quite different set of problems than prevention. Nature is not going to negotiate. If it's changing, it's changing, and we're going to have impacts. Some of you, and they're going to be very quick and gone and over, and there's not going to be a policy response. So you may have seen in the news this past week, is this a result of climate change? I leave that to the side. Could it be? Yes. There were a lot more rains in Costa Rica this year. So the fruit, um, the trees, the forests were a lot wetter. The fruit rotted. And there's this group of monkeys that have just starved. And they're gone. And it's a very quick change that happens. They don't adapt. And so something changes. So what's the message we should take here? And I would say there are two. Because we're going to have limited responses to react to the impact of climate change. Um, one is to avoid wasteful reactions. Uh, again, we have limited responses. And just imagine for a moment that the world was always a world that was changing quickly. Or let's say we went into space and we came down on another planet and the surface of the planet changed quickly. We would have a very different legal social order on that planet. No one would own property. Right? Everyone would move quickly. Everyone would think of how, how do we adapt all the time to something. So as we're forced with a necessity to adapt, I think we need to think about, are we trying to somehow hold back the flood here when we are, our assumption's always been there's no change? Or is this one of those things that is going to change and we need to think about it? And I would say there's a lot of very subtle things here. One, one piece of work I did, I tried to identify what I call social feedbacks. So John will speak to physical feedbacks, where the Earth warms, something physically changes, it increases the warming. That's a physical feedback. To me, a social feedback is the Earth warms, your reaction is um, to do something in response to that warming. Not to stop the warming, but for totally wasteful reasons. The, it's a rather complicated story I have, but it has to do with uh, our property in the oceans depends, is measured from rocks that just come out at low tide. <laughs> right? And there are some places in the world where they have made, Japan in one instance, has spent a great deal of money to protect the rock. Right? Now that's a pretty wasteful thing because we assumed that the rock would always be there. Really, we should just assume the rock is going under. Don't bother to protect it. Just keep your boundary constant. But thinking through a lot of things like that is going to be very important to just avoid wasting money. 
On the other side, and I think this is more a research agenda, I think the operative word is triage. And we have to really think about what are our priorities for what should be saved amidst change. Whether it's the monkeys in Costa Rica or a certain coastal life that must be preserved at all costs, right? Um, but we need to think about what is important because there's only gonna be a limited set of resources and we need to think how to apply them most effectively. Now I'd like to end up with a little, uh, to me an irony, that goes to Errol's talk, and that is Errol, Errol, excuse me, correctly points out that there is um, an effort in the climate change emissions talk to point out that the rich nations, those who have admitted the most, they have the hard obligations. The developing countries at the moment do not have those obligations. Ironically, on the adaptation side, it is the developing countries that have the least resources to deal with, with what's coming. It may be the case that some developed countries can deploy resources and somehow get through some of the impacts. But I don't, uh, it will be the developing countries that face the greatest challenges. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. John Hart. I'll start with some comments that John Wilson made. I've, I was very um, much in agreement with his optimism about implementing energy efficiency, and I completely share uh, the goal of uh, accelerating the, the, our efforts in the area of efficiency. But I want to turn to two things he said. One was a particular um, uh, situation that we will face in the year 2050 if current emission trends continue and we don't do something about the problem. What he stated was that we will see a tripling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and as a result we should implement the stabilization wedges. Now I want to introduce the concept of destabilization wedges. Wedges that work in the opposite direction of this laudable goal of stabilization wedges. A destabilization wedge is an increment of carbon dioxide or methane, which is also a greenhouse gas, that will come out of the soil, out of the tundra, or out of the ocean into the atmosphere for two reasons over the next 50 years. One reason is as the planet warms, Soils release these gases and make the problem harder than we thought it was. That's, that's the, the most important reason. The other reason why I think he's overly optimistic about how much carbon dioxide will be in the atmosphere in the year 2050, that is why I think the problem will be worse than that, is because not all the carbon we emit to the atmosphere today stays there. Some of it is going back into the biosphere, making trees grow a little bigger and faster. But those, uh, what we call sinks, for carbon, places where the carbon goes to from the atmosphere, those are getting saturated, they're getting used up. And the result is that what we're beginning to see is an accelerating amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere above and beyond what you'd predict from just the emissions from our fossil fuel burning. And so the problem is more difficult than we thought. We have a harder target ahead of us if we're gonna solve the real problem. What we project from studies, these are based on uh, data that we obtained by analyzing how carbon dioxide changed during the Ice Age era and how it's changing as the planet warmed, what we project is that whereas conventional climate models predict that under a doubling of carbon dioxide, there'll be about a four and a half degree warming at the upper limit. Well, with these feedbacks occurring, that four and a half degree warming will turn into a six or seven degree warming. 
which is much more intense and more worrisome. That in turn will speed up, accelerate the melting of Greenland ice. If the entire Greenland ice sheet melts out, which it could in 100 or 150 years, we'd see a 25 foot rise in sea level. And with the melting of the Greenland ice, Greenland, which today is white and shiny and therefore reflects sunlight, will become dark brown, the color of the soil under the ice, and that will absorb sunlight and further accelerate the warming. And what I want to emphasize is that these accelerating effects are not in our current climate models. If they were, we would be even more scared than we are today, and we should be more scared than we are today. That was point number one. Uh, I want to um, make a comment on something. I was very impressed with what Lars said about the uh, role that the uh, Swedish EPA is playing with the media. I think dealing with the media is absolutely critical. And I want to just very quickly put in a plug for an activity happening here on the Berkeley campus in the School of Journalism. Uh, I have teamed up with, as a sort of a scientific advisor, to a course it's taught for 11 graduate students. Uh, the professor is Sandy Tolan. Uh, and these 11 graduate students are, had, had the tremendous fortune to be sent out to 11 corners of the planet, from the South Pacific, where sea level rise is having an impact on people in South Pacific islands, to farmers living at the base of Kilimanjaro, where a disappearing glacier threatens their water supply, to people in the Andes also seeing the loss of glaciers, to folks in Bangladesh facing a huge threat of sea level rise, to people up in the Hudson Bay area of Canada who are seeing the loss of the polar bears, which very likely will go extinct with current trends in global warming. It turns out the polar bears are the base of their economy because five or 10,000 tourists come there each uh, autumn to see the bears and, and uh, it's, it's how the, the towns up there have sustained themselves. So what these students have done is gone around the world and the course is called Early Signs because they're doing a story about how people on the ground in remote places are feeling the first signs of global warming. And it's a fascinating story. And of course, one of the things they encounter, just as anyone reading the newspapers here will encounter, is skepticism about global warming. Local people who say, nah, we've survived you know, this problem and that problem in the past, and we're, we're confident. But the more sober minds that they've encountered are all quite worried. And for example, South Pacific Islanders are negotiating, trying to negotiate with New Zealand and Australia for refugees to go. Because when these islands disappear, Many of them are just a few feet above sea level. And when they disappear, these folks have no country, no home, no land, and they have to, um, we have to find some place for them. And of course, these are not the people who are causing the problem. They're not emitting the greenhouse gases. It's us who are doing that. So one of the lessons from this course has been that journalism doesn't have to follow the standard practice of making dueling experts the news. It's been the practice until rather recently, and with some wonderful exceptions like 60 Minutes recently, to make the story about global warming a story about how experts disagree. Well, it turns out that these half the, the experts who say this is a big problem are scientists who publish in peer-reviewed journals. The so-called <laughs> experts who say the opposite are people often without any scientific training, but who know just enough of the language in order to come across as experts. And then if they get equal time, the public ends up befuddled. So I'm very glad to see what, what Sweden is doing in this, in this area. And I think here at the School of Journalism, we're training a, a new generation of journalists who will treat the science policy uh, interface much more sensibly than it's been uh, treated in the past. Finally, just a quick note, um, Harold mentioned taxation and in Norway the role that taxation can play. I, I want to inject just a thought, and I don't want to say this too dogmatically, but 
There is a conventional view that a carbon tax would be the ideal solution to this problem in the United States. Well, there's a, one thing about a carbon tax concerns me, and that's the the equity issues. A carbon tax, like any sales tax, is regressive. And especially a tax on something like gasoline, because poor people spend a much larger fraction of their income on energy than rich people. So maybe we should, just maybe, we should think about not putting a tax on bad energy so it costs more, but rather using taxation to make good energy cost less. And the idea would be to take the Republican tax break on the rich, rescind it, but take that same amount of tax break money and give it to the companies and the homeowners and anyone else who is buying or selling clean energy, carbon-free energy. And I think with a policy like that, it would be progressive instead of regressive, because making something all of us, including the poor, consume cheaper is a good thing to do. And I think a tax break on the profits from the sale of clean energy would do more to spur technological development mm. than an increased tax on bad energy. So I'm going to leave you with that thought, and um, uh, that's all I have to say.